Chapter Seven. The route Ifilwil had chosen was a rambling one, straying down side corridors and circumventing the main hallways. But Brunner was impressed by how alone their path had left them. Even in the desolate environs of Musilon, Brunner knew that a nobleman of such station as Duke Marimond would have a host of servants, seeing to the upkeep of the castle and the personal comfort of his household. Then there would be the Duke's soldiers to consider. Given the hostile climate in which Marimond was surrounded, there would be quite a few men-at-arms residing within the walls of the castle as well. All things considered. The fact that they had not encountered a living soul was quite remarkable. Gabino had an answer to that. As they turned yet another corner, only to find the hallway beyond vacant, the rogue cast an appraising look at Olgrin. "It must be the perfume you're wearing," the man quipped. Olgrin's face contorted into a scowl beneath his beard, and for a moment. It seemed he might allow Gabino a much closer view of his axe. Then the glint of greed twinkled in the dwarf's eyes, draining the hostility from him as though he'd been drenched in ice cold water. Five hundred gold if he dies. Olgrin muttered to himself, reciting it over and over again, as though it were some holy mantra from far away cafe. After several more twists and turns. Ifilwale motioned for her companions to stop. She removed a large iron key from her belt, slipping it across the hallway. Pressing her long, slender fingers to the stone wall, she slid one of the bricks upward, exposing a hidden keyhole. Olgrin shuffled forward to get a better look at the cunning piece of engineering, wearing a look of interest that was no less appraising than that which Gabino had favored the dwarf with minutes earlier. The enchantress placed a pale hand to her face, recoiling from the dwarf's filth-caked figure. Olgrin grunted angrily and stepped back once more. With the dwarf withdrawn to a less odorous distance, Ifilwale inserted the key, twisting it in the lock, then motioned for Brunner to assist her. The bounty hunter nodded, stepping forward to press his hands where the elf had indicated. Together, the two began to push the wall inward, exposing a hidden passage. This was used by the old lords of the castle. Back when Musilan was prosperous and the noble families more bound by the laws of honor and propriety, Ifilwale told Brunner as they stepped into the passageway. Olgrin, pushing Gabino before him, stomped in after the pair. They found that such a hidden corridor allowed a certain discretion when seeking out dalliances that might have proven embarrassing were they to be known. Where was this when I was dallying with Tiza? Gobineau commented, eyes carefully studying the passageway. The passage was narrow, the monotony of its length broken every forty feet by a steel lever mounted beside the cogwheel. As Gobineau inspected the nearest of these devices, peering over the shoulders of an equally curious Olgrin, the elf stepped to the device and released the lever. Instantly, the wall that had been pushed inward shot back into its former place, taking with it the light from the hallway. And how might an elf learn of such a hidden path? Olgrin asked, glaring even more suspiciously than usual at Ifilwale. A dwarf might spot the trick right away, but how does some slinking tall year pick up something of that sort? Brunner ignored the dwarf's surly voice, removing a torch, leaning outward from an iron sconce fitted to the wall, and thrust it toward Olgrin so that the dwarf might light it, illuminating the narrow passage for all with eyes less used to the dark than the cavern-bred dwarf. Olgrin's annoyance hissed out from behind his beard, but he soon had a small tinder box in his hand. A moment later. The torch blazed into fiery life. The first thing the bounty hunter saw was the icy smile that Ifilwale had forced onto her face. 
She bowed with strained, exaggerated courtesy toward the dwarf. I have been a prisoner within these walls for some time. She spoke the words as though instructing a slow-witted child. I have had many days to wander these halls, learning every crack in the stones. In time, even an elf might be expected to take notice of so elaborate an artifice. She turned away from the glowering dwarf, facing Brunner once again. These halls are sealed, so that neither light nor draught might betray their presence. We can travel along the length to the far end of the corridor, which will place us just outside Merriman's private chambers. You spoke of some guards, Brunner reminded her. The elf nodded sadly. They will have to be dealt with, she replied. If we are fortunate, there will only be two. They will be stationed outside the door. The bounty hunter nodded his head. If the wall retreats faster from the inside than it does from the outside, we can be on them before they know what is happening. Brunner stated, That is, if there are only two. If there are guards, Olgrin snorted, then they are your problem. I'm perfectly happy leaving this place right now. He turned a menacing eye on Gobineau. I already have what I came here to collect. Gobineau stays with me, Brunner warned, glaring down at a dwarf. If you want to hang back in the passage, do so. But the bandit goes where I go. Olgren held the bounty hunter's hostile gaze, then smiled beneath his beard. As you want, Brunner, the dwarf agreed. I might even be persuaded to help you, say for five gold pieces each guard. Both of the bounty killers fingered their weapons, waiting for the other to make the first move. Gobineau appeared at Olgrin's shoulder, waving his hands to gain the attention of his captors. If it's all the same, he said, why don't I stay in the passage with the dwarf? You can do what you have to do, and we'll still be here waiting for you to get back. The rogue clenched his fist, shaking it for emphasis. You have my solemn word of honor on this matter. Both bounty hunters rolled their eyes. Just keep an eye on him, Brunner snarled, pointing a finger at Gobineau. If there's any killing to be done, I'll do it. The bounty hunter looked once more at Ithilwale. Lead away, if you would. The elf nodded her head, clearly eager to proceed. She had watched the haggling between man and dwarf, with obvious impatience. This way, she said. We must hurry. I do not know how long we may expect Merriman to be away. Brunner and Ithilwale started down the corridor. Olgrin, Balax, and Gobineau watched the two walk away. The dwarf's eyes began to narrow with suspicion. Brunner had agreed to allowing him to stand guard over their prisoner far too easily. Were the roles reversed, Olgrin certainly would not have trusted Brunner with a captive worth two thousand pieces of gold. The dwarf rubbed at his beard as he considered the problem. He groaned in disgust as he reached the only possible conclusion. What? Where are we going? Gobineau demanded as the dwarf pushed him down the corridor, urging the man to hurry so they could catch up with Brunner and Ithilwale. Aren't we going to stay here? Olgrin snarled at his prisoner to close his mouth and keep quiet. Very cunning of Brunner. Very cunning indeed. There was only one reason the other bounty hunter would have risked Olgrin making off with Gobineau while he was away. Retrieving his precious sword indeed. That elf witch had told Brunner about some hidden treasure of the Mad Duke, a treasure that would make the bounty on Gobineau's head look like pig slop by comparison. So, 
Brunner thought he could cheat Algren of his share in such a find, especially after all the hardships the dwarf had endured to sneak his way into the cursed castle. Well, if he thought dwarves were such fools as that, then he'd been listening to that elf wench for far too long. The sentries, standing watch outside the chambers of their lord, the Duke Marimond, leaned tiredly upon their spears. Theirs was a dull, uneventful post. The possibility of an intruder making his way into the castle was remote, some might say even impossible. None had done so for years, not since one of the rival noblemen of Musilon had employed an Estalian assassin to attempt to remove their master's claim over the city in a rather forceful fashion. So it was that the two soldiers were less attentive and wary than they might have otherwise been, their minds more focused upon the dice games unfolding in the barracks during their absence than they were upon the quiet, lonely stretch of corridor. Abruptly, impossibly, the wall across the hallway disappeared, replaced by a patch of shadowy blackness. Even as the two men-at-arms snapped out of their fatigue and stared in amazement at a strange sight, a figure rushed from the shadows. He was dressed in the same manner as the two sentries, and the minds of the two guards puzzled over this as much as the hidden passage from which the man had emerged. Was he some herald? Some spy of the Duke's, carrying with him a message of vital importance? The confused guards hesitated, allowing the other soldier to close upon them before another fact registered in their minds. The man approaching them held a sword in his hands. Far too late, the two sentries began to raise their spears. Brunner's stolen sword split the belly of one, before he had even begun to point his own weapon forward. The man shouted in agony, falling away to clutch at his mortal injury. The other guard fared slightly better, stabbing at Brunner with his spear. But the guard's reflexes were far too slow, his reactions dulled by the abrupt intrusion into the midnight snooze, and the frost passed harmlessly to one side of the bounty hunter. Safely passed, the stabbing point of the man-at-arms' spear, Brunner lashed out with his blade, the sharp edge of the sword crunching down into the side of the soldier's neck. A gargling scream rasped from the maimed man, and he too fell to the floor beside his dying comrade. Brunner studied his handiwork for a moment. Armed with his own equipment, he'd have been able to dispatch the two man-at-arms much more swiftly, sending a bolt into each of them, before they'd even registered the opening of the secret passage. The bounty hunter did not avoid combat, but he preferred to save it for occasions when there was a price attached to his opponent. Men who had no value were better disposed of from a safe distance. Sloppy! The gruff voice of Algrin grated upon Brunner's ears. The bounty hunter turned to observe his companions emerging from the hidden passage. If Ilwell looked upon the two dying soldiers, her strange eyes subdued by a covering of pity. She shook her head, then strode toward the doorway the two dying men had given their lives to protect. Brunner watched with interest as the elf extended her hand, the delicate fingers lightly touching the cold bronze handle. Behind him, he could hear Algrin snorting with contempt. If she thinks that door is not locked, then she really is an idiot. Faintly, Brunner could hear her speaking in a strange, somehow musical language. Though he could not understand the words, the bounty hunter knew that there was magic within them, drawing power into the elf maiden's fingers. Soon, the sound of groaning metal could be heard above the whispered incantation of the Enchantress. With no further warning, the heavy bronze handle and the iron lock to which it was fixed fell from the door, clattering upon the stone floor. Where they had been fitted to the door, Brunner could see that the wood was charred and blackened. A faint mist of steam rose from the swiftly cooling lock. 
Ethelwell indulged in a smug smile, directing the expression back at Algren, before pushing the door inward. The dwarf grumbled into his beard, pushing Gabineau ahead of him as Brunner followed the elf into Merriman's chambers. Any damn fool can pick a lock with sorcery. The dwarf spat under his beard, his hold upon his axe a trifle firmer than it had been before the elf witch had displayed her magic. The dwarf was even more sullen when he saw the nature of the duke's room. There was a modest degree of wealth displayed in the furnishings and appointments that graced the chamber, but hardly anything that would impress someone who had walked through the halls of the dwarf kings. Since deciding that Brunner's true motivation in coming here was to loot Merriman's wealth, Olgren had built up an image in his mind that might have impoverished an Arabian sultan. The dwarf's eyes narrowed, however, as a new thought came to him. Perhaps Merriman didn't like to flaunt his wealth. Maybe he kept it hidden, a small chest filled with gold coins, or a jewelry box overflowing with diamonds. Olgren stabbed a finger at Gobineau. Stand right there, the dwarf commanded Gobineau, pointing at a spot almost at the center of the room. Move and I'll chop your legs off and feed them to you, he added when the thief opened his mouth to protest. Algren saw Brunner and Ithilwale striding toward a large table set against the wall, their eyes focused upon the clutter of objects strewn upon it. The dwarf smiled. Even the most slovenly of noblemen was not going to leave valuables in such disarray. He left the bounty hunter and the elf to their foolishness, dropping into a crouch and peering under the duke's bed, hoping to discover a hidden strong box. Alone in the center of the room, Gobineau's eyes strayed from one bounty hunter to the other, then gazed longingly at a door which connected to the hallway beyond. Now knowing about the hidden passage, the rogue was confident he'd be able to elude Merriman's guards were he to gain his liberty. The real problem lay in getting some distance between himself and the two bounty killers. The dwarf might be distracted with his hunt for hidden valuables, but the sour glances he directed at Gobineau told the outlaw that he was far from forgotten. He decided that he wouldn't forget about two thousand gold crowns either, no matter how high his hopes to better his fortune. The rogue pursed his lips, watching and waiting. An opportunity might yet reveal itself, if he was observant and patient, and perhaps a little lucky, Ranald willing. Brunner fastened the weapon belt above his waist, sliding the familiar length of Drake's malice into its sheath. There were few things the bounty hunter placed any value upon, but the famous sword of the barons von Drakenberg was one of them. With the sword back in his possession, the knowing sense of unease and loss that had afflicted him since Ithilwil had released him from the dungeons left him. He felt whole once again, complete. He began to wrap another weapon belt about his body, this one holding the array of knives he employed in his bloody vocation, the heavy weight of the headsman, a massive butchering knife with a serrated edge, resting against his right hip. His prized repeating crossbow and black powder pistol were also among the objects scattered upon the table, and their recovery brought a grim smile to Brunner's harsh features. Merriman would regret not killing him when he had a chance. Brunner would make certain of that before he saw the last of Musilon. His hands closed about the carved spike of wood, he had purchased from an impoverished Sigmarite priest in the Tylean port city of Miragliano nearly a year past. Perhaps he'd attend to the vampire knight Corbus as well, if the opportunity presented itself. While Brunner occupied himself reclaiming his weapons, Ithilwell lifted the fell fang from the table, feeling a great surge of relief well up within her. 
The dread artifact was safe now, out of the reach of fools who did not understand its power, and even greater fools who might be mad enough to use it. The elf took the carved ivory covering, slipping it back over the fell fang, concealing the ancient tooth once more. There would be much more to do now. The bounty hunter would need to get her out of the filthy human city. She was certain that she could prey upon the debt he owed her for his own release, to at least get her that far. After that, things were more nebulous. She would have to find a way to get back to her own people, for the fell fang's potential for destruction and ruin would only be fully averted once it was locked away within one of the vaults beneath the Tower of Sorcery in Ulfuan. There was a small colony of her people in the city of Marienburg, far to the north. She would have to try for that and wait for the next ship to return her to her native land. The bounty hunter might be less agreeable about accompanying her that far. She might very well need to engage others to protect her on the long road to Marienburg. That was a problem she would deal with when the time arrived. For now, she would allow herself to enjoy the successful acquisition of the fell fang before it was too late. If it wasn't already too late. The thought sent a chill of dread coursing through the elf, purging her of her relief that had filled her only moments before. What if Merriman had been toying with the thing in his examination of it? The fool might have accidentally awakened powers he knew nothing about. If the dragon that had been bound to the fell fang were still alive, it would be ancient, older even than the vaunted empire and the kingdom of Bretonia and all the other realms which the humans pompously called the Old World. Dragons were things that did not diminish over time, but continued to grow in might and power until death at last stilled their fiery hearts. The monster bound for the fell fang would be a thing of such power, more like a living storm than a mortal creature. And if that fool Merrimond had been playing with the fang, if he had awakened the beast, it might even now be flying for the castle. Even now, wings of doom might be descending from the sky to crush the city into ash and cinder. So lost in these morbid thoughts of dread was Ithilwil that she did not notice the path her steps took her as she backed away from the table. Her slender shape strayed close to where Olgrin had ordered Gobino to stand. The rogue watched her approach with bated breath, seeing an opportunity about to present itself. The outlaw's eyes narrowed as he noticed the object the elf held in her hands the same object he had come here to try and sell to Merrimond. The fell fang. Perhaps there really was power within the object, Gobineau decided, if both a crazed wizard and an elf witch coveted the thing with such recklessness as to risk their lives to get it. The rogue changed his plan even as he moved forward to implement it. After all, why should he escape without taking something with him to redress the trials he had been subjected to? Gabineau was certain now that there was a very real power encased within the ivory cylinder. He was not certain how, but he would use that power, use it to establish himself in the luxury that was his due, some place far away from jealous husbands and bloodthirsty bounty hunters. Gabineau caught Ithilwale by the wrist, spinning her life body around so that his arm wrapped around her throat. The sudden movement caught the elf completely off guard, so absorbed was she by her own thoughts of dread. Her reaction, however, was far swifter than Gabineau had allowed for, a boot smashing into his calf with a strength the outlaw would have never imagined within so lightly built a person. The elf spun away from the clutching brigand as he crumpled painfully to one knee. But as she did so, Gabineau twisted a hand holding her wrist. Ithilwale grimaced in pain and the fell fang clattered to the floor. Before she could recover, the rogue had regained his prize. Gabineau twisted the hidden catch, 
satisfying himself that the hidden relic was still safe within its vessel. Looking up, the bandit shuddered. His sudden assault on the elf had drawn quite a deal of attention. The looks in the eyes of Brunner and Olgrin Balax were as murderous as any the rogue had ever seen. He began to raise his hands in a gesture of submission, fearing that he was only a few seconds from having the unpleasant experience of either the dwarf's massive axe or Brunner's recently recovered sword bisecting his face. Stop him from using the fang! Ifilwale shouted, momentarily drawing the attention of the two bounty hunters. Gobineau's thoughts raced. Use the fang? And how exactly by all the dark gods was he supposed to do that? Still, there was no mistaking the terror in the elf witch's eyes. Gobineau noticed that he'd been lifting his hands when she had shouted and that the one holding the artifact was poised near his own face. A sudden thought occurred to the outlaw. That's right, Gobineau called out in what he hoped was a threatening tone. Take one step toward me, and we're all in trouble. He set out the hollowed-out bone against his lower lip, bringing another gasp from Ifilwale. It seemed that his guess might have been right after all. He really must remember to tithe a bit of his next hole to Ranald to thank the mischievous god of thieves for the turn his luck had taken. Unfortunately, Brunner and Algren did not seem to be sharing the elf's fright. The two bounty hunters passed a look between them, then began to circle around their prey. Gobineau swallowed nervously. Hadn't Brunner said something about alive, not meaning unharmed? The rogue inhaled sharply, the breath rasping against the surface of the fang. Ifilwale winced in tandem to the bandit's breath. Don't antagonize him, she cried. If he sounds the fang, we will all die. He'll call up a monster that will bring the whole castle crashing about our ears. The already pale skin of the elf was now the pallor of alabaster as the warmth drained from her face, cringing within her fear. She is right. I'll do it. Gobineau called out, trying to add as much support for whatever nonsense the elf was shrieking as he could. You two would better step back, Gobineau warned, when it became obvious that the bounty hunters weren't listening. Brunner's icy eyes glared into the rogue's own. Do as he says, pleaded Ifilwale. To Gobineau's amazement, Brunner took a step backward. The outlaw felt a smile warming on his face. That's better, he crowed. Now, lower your weapons, he added with a hopeful note. To his relief, Brunner slammed his sword back into its scabbard. Algren looked at his partner, the dwarf's eyes wide with disbelief. Since when do we take orders from some hussy tall ear? The dwarf demanded. We don't, Brunner replied, removing his pistol from its holster. Algren laughed grimly as the bounty hunter pointed the intimidating weapon at Gobineau. I just decided I didn't feel like doing any more work today. How do you know it's still loaded? Gobineau asked feebly. How do you know it's not? The bounty hunter retorted, his voice as cheerless as an open grave. The outlaw sighed loudly, glancing about the room around him trying to find some way to salvage the situation. To his left, Olgren glared at him, the edge of his monstrous axe gleaming wickedly. To his right, a much more composed, though still visibly shaken, Ifilwale was beginning to step nearer. Gobineau imagined she might be planning on replaying the little scene that had initiated the standoff, and he didn't think his chances of overcoming the elf were terribly good. Before him, the infamous Brunner had a pistol pointed at his face. Cain's black blood, Gobineau cursed as he exhaled into the fell fang. 
whatever monster the magic artifact was going to conjure up, it couldn't be worse than what he was already facing. The outlaw screwed his eyes shut, expecting a sound of thunder, an explosive display of sorcery, as some demonic horror manifested itself to answer the fang's summons. Instead, there was only silence. Opening his eyes again, Gabinot saw the elf witch shaking, leaning against a chair to prevent herself from falling, such was the lack of strength in her limbs. Not exactly some hell-spawned abomination with claws and fangs, but he wasn't going to complain. Turning to regard the bounty hunters, however, Gabinot learned that his desperate gamble had not been universal in its effects. I don't think they'll mind too much if he's missing his hands when we turn him in. Olgrin growled, stepping forward. Once again, Gabinot found his eyes focusing on the wickedly sharp edge of the dwarf's gigantic axe. No doubt about it. The next time he passed a shrine to Ranald, he was going to set fire to it. Even as the two bounty hunters began to close on him, Gabinot's luck reasserted itself. Without warning, the door to Merriman's room exploded inward, propelled by some tremendous force. All eyes turned to the doorway to see the red-armored figure of Sir Corbus standing in the doorway. The knight's face no longer resembled anything human, eyes blazing with wrath, gash-like mouth parted in a feral snarl, wolf-like fangs exposed. The knight held his sword in his hand, but it seemed to all observing that he was more likely to rip them apart with his bare hands than remember to use his weapon. You traitor witch! Corbus roared. Is this how you return the protection and support your lord has given you? Freeing his prisoners and robbing his rooms! A trickle of bloody froth oozed from the corner of the knight's mouth as he spat his accusations at Ithilwail. I'll strip the skin from your flesh and toss the screaming carcass to the rats for your faithlessness, slattern! So intent was Corbus on the objects of his ire, the figures of Gabinot, Brunner and Ithilwail, that he had paid scant notice of the room's other occupant. Olgrin listened to the vampire's hissed maledictions, his own anger boiling up within the dwarf. With a savage cry, Olgrin lunged at a grey knight, swinging his axe in a gleaming arc of destruction. By the gods of my ancestors! Olgrin bellowed. I've had enough of this city! The blade of the axe struck Corbus's breastplate, with all the strength the dwarf's brawny frame could muster. The metal shrieked as it split under the cleaving edge, and the axe chewed into the flesh beneath. You're not going to stop me from getting out of here! Olgren ripped his axe free, leaving a great gash in Corbus's chest, torn flesh and fragments of bone clinging to the weapon as it was withdrawn. The vampire's face contorted, in an expression of still greater fury. But before Corbus could react, the axe slammed into his body once again, knocking the knight to the floor. Olgren stood before the snarling creature, chopping into the prone vampire as though hacking at a log. Killer frogs! Olgren cursed, chopping into the vampire's chest again. Cannibal madman! Again, the axe was ripped free. Acres of quicksand! Once more, the axe rent the knight's breastplate. Ulgrin leaned forward to howl into the vampire's face. I've done enough work to earn ten times what this scum is fetching, and I'll be damned if I'll just hand it over to some preening, posturing, manling knight. Ulgrin stared into the knight's eyes, waiting to see the life fade from them. With the carnage he had visited upon the warrior as the dwarf vented his frustrations, Olgrin was certain that he would not have long to wait. Instead, the knight's eyes blazed into pools of crimson fire, and his mouth opened into a grisly snarl. The knight's right hand came sweeping upward, striking the dwarf with a strength 
that would shame a full-grown ox. Three hundred pounds of armored dwarf sailed across the room, pulverizing the glass curio cabinet as Olgrin landed. Sir Corbus rose to his feet, simply tilting his body upright, rather than lifting himself from the floor. The knight's crimson armor was a ruin of twisted metal, deep and grisly wounds visible through the rents in the armored plate. Any one of the wounds would have been fatal to any normal man, but Corbus seemed oblivious to them. He took a step forward, his mailed fist closing about the handle of the huge axe Olgrin had left buried in his breastbone. With a single sharp tug, Corbus wrenched the axe free, dropping it to the floor with such casualness that it might have been no more than a splinter removed from a finger. The vampire's face broadened into a predatory sneer, the face of a cat preparing to pounce. The little man has seen many of the ills of this abominable city. The vampire hissed. Now I shall show you the true nature of horror. Brunner had watched the brief battle between Olgrin and Corbus with a gnawing sense of doom. He knew what the knight was. He had seen similar creatures before, and his experiences told him that it took more than a strong arm and a sharp blade to destroy such a being. As Olgrin had hacked away at the undead knight, Brunner had shifted his pistol into his offhand and once again removed Drake's malice from its sheath. He had seen for himself that the enchanted blade could harm beings immune to natural steel. Had not a blade bitten deep into the demonic flesh of the horrific Mardrag during the Death Elemental's rampage in the city of Ramus? Perhaps it might prove no less effective in dealing with the spectral vitality of a vampire. As Corbus stalked forward, Brunner noted that the elf Ifilwil had fallen behind the bounty hunter. He could hear the elf muttering in the same strangely musical voice she had used before destroying the lock. Brunner hoped that whatever magic she was able to conjure, it was quick and far more potent. You would dare cross swords with me? The vampire sneered as he stopped an arm's span from Brunner. I've killed men whose boots you're not fit to lick with but three passes of my blade. Amuse me, assassin, before I cut your filthy soul from your mangy carcass. Brunner dodged the first thrust made by Sir Corbus, exploiting the knight's attack to slash at him with the edge of Drake's malice. But the bounty hunter had underestimated the unnatural speed of the vampire. With a blur of motion, Corbus recovered from the thrust, bringing the blade sweeping around in a parrying block. Such was the angle of the blow and the tremendous strength behind it that Drake's malice was ripped from Brunner's gloved hand, the longsword bouncing from the far wall as it was flung away. Die like the vermin you are! The vampire snarled, springing forward, his fangs bared. The bounty hunter retreated back a space, bringing up his other hand, slamming the barrel of the pistol under Corbus's chin. Take your own advice, Brunner growled. The bounty hunter's finger pulled the trigger, the pistol roaring in response to the action. The violent explosion of flame and smoke set the vampire's flesh smoldering, the lead bullet smashing through the knight's face, breaking his jaw and cracking his cheek before bursting through the edge of his left eye. Shards of bone and black ichor sprayed from the monster's injury, even as his strangled cry ripped across the chamber. Corbus toppled to the floor, armored hands clutching at the smoking ruin of his face. Brunner glared down at the monster, then kicked the vampire, waiting for any sort of response. But Corbus was as still as the grave he'd cheated. The bounty hunter nodded, then fingered the carved stake he had bought from an exiled Sigmarite priest months before in Miragliano. Maybe a vampire couldn't survive with half his face blown apart, but Brunner was not taking chances. 
Every tale he'd heard agreed that a vampire most certainly didn't survive a wooden stake stabbed through its heart. You can quit your spellcraft, Brunner said, noticing that Ethelwil had not ceased her conjuring. He's as dead as he's going to get, he elaborated, fingering the stake. Or at least he's about to be. He glanced back at the elf, surprised by what he saw. The enchantress had ceased her conjuring, whatever spell she had worked upon Corbus, now at its end. The bounty hunter had no way of knowing that it had been the elf's spells that had preserved him, that had slowed the blood dragon's unnatural reflexes to a point where a mere mortal might gain even the faintest hope of besting him. Now Ithilwail seemed oblivious to the vampire, oblivious to everything. Her eyes were focused upon the ceiling, darting back and forth as though she expected a horde of demons to drop down on her. The strange tongue she spoke seemed to be locked into a rhythm, repeating itself over and over. Her entire body was trembling, shaking like a river reed in a winter wind. Brunner took a step towards her, reaching out and carefully touching her shoulder. Ithilwale's head snapped around, her fear-filled eyes fixing upon the bounty hunter. The sing-song rhyme died as reason reasserted itself within the enchantress's mind. The fang! She gasped. The fool used the fang! He's called death upon us all! The mention of the fool caused Brunner to forget his interest in the elf woman. He spun back around, eyes scoring the room. He saw Olgrin rising from the ruin of the curio cabinet, the dwarf's meaty hand rubbing at his bruised head. He saw Drake's malice lying near the wall, but he saw no sign of Gobineau. The rogue had taken advantage of the vampire's attack to slip away once again. Brunner cursed under his breath. Forget taking the man's hands, when he caught up with the outlaw, he was going to take his legs, to make sure the scum didn't run off again. The bounty hunter shook his head. Algren was right. Catching the vermin was more work than it was worth. A cold smile flickered on Brunner's face. At least he'd be able to repay Corbus for all the fun times he and the vampire had shared. But as Brunner turned back toward the vampire's body, he cursed again. The red armor was still there, but it was now empty. Looking past the spot, the bounty hunter saw a great black rat with a mangled face pause at the mouth of a crack in the wall to glare malevolently at him. Brunner reached for a throwing knife, but as he started to move, the rat scuttled away down the hole. The fang! Ithilwail was beside him once more. We have to get it back, before it's too late. Brunner ignored her, walking to the wall and retrieving Drake's malice. He looked back at Algren, watching as the dwarf stumbled groggily away from the ruined cabinet. He'd be just as happy to leave the dwarf, but he needed to know where the tunnel entrance to Merriman's castle was. The bounty hunter grabbed the dwarf, pushing him toward the door. I only care about catching that scum, Brunner told the elf. That knick-knack he stole from you is your concern. The bounty hunter cast a worried look at the rat hole. You help us find Gobineau, you help yourself. He did not wait for Ithilwale's reply, but strode out into the hallway, leaving her to make her own decision. The elf hesitated a moment, then hurried after the departing bounty hunters. She'd made her play. Now she had to see it through.